the Moog Modular, it's the ultimate synthesizer. It's the coolest, most powerful, big, monster, iconic instrument. This is the EMMS, Emerson Moog Modular System. The Keith Emerson Modular System was the biggest, strongest, most powerful system of its time. We studied original Moog synthesizers to create a faithful recreation of the original Keith Emerson instrument. Just a short time ago, this seemed completely impossible. There was no way it could be done just right. There was no way it could be done to the standards we wanted to hold it to, but we actually did it. And it's exactly 50 years to the month that Moog created the first system to be shown in public at AES 1964. This is a painstakingly detailed replica of Keith Emerson's famous modular synthesizer, which is really a one of a kind. Part of what we did was dig into the original files. We wanted to find original circuit designs, the original panel artwork and things like that to make these modules exactly what the old ones were. Not even a recreation, but using the original plans and documents that they'd used in the factory in the old days. We take circuit boards and the sheet metal and the front panels and the parts from the bins and put them all together to build the individual modules that slide into the wood cabinets. These are actually built like old radios. They're built by hand and, you know, hand-wired wood screws screwed into wood to hold brackets in and things like that. There's no automated assembly of anything in here. One of the great parts about this is this is the history of Moog. This is one of the most iconic designs of a synthesizer ever made. It was the summer, I believe, of 1969, and uh, uh, as far as the media was concerned, we were getting hot. You know, you couldn't do anything uh, more attention-grabbing than use a Moog synthesizer somehow. So the Museum of Modern Art in New York City called us up and said, uh, would you be interested in putting on a concert in our Jazz in the Garden series? The garden was the garden of the museum, uh, was, was a sculpture garden. Now at the time, we had really no instruments at all that could be played live. But we decided, uh, you know, this sounds like, like fun. And uh, it turned out that we really didn't have enough time to, uh, to design and build the perfect ensemble of instruments. But we did put uh, one, two, three, four instruments together. In 1969, Mogan made a set of presets that attached to one of their traditional Moog synthesizers. And most people don't know they made this preset system for one specific performance in New York City at a museum. All of these instruments were equipped uh, with special uh, preset boxes uh, where you could set up a combination of things ahead of time and push a button and quickly change from one thing to the other. That's what you really need for a live performance. We contact some of our musician friends put on this concert, it was mobbed. There were 4,000 people in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art. Moog was happy to promote the artists because that was the outlet. It wasn't the features so much they were selling, it was the music these people created. The features happened to be great tools for the musicians, but things like pitch bend control, uh, sequencers, filters that sounded great, that, those were tools for the artists to make great music, and that's what really affected people. After the concert, uh, we had these uh, instruments uh, made up, and we wondered what to do with them, so we told our, our London distributor they were available if anybody wanted them. And somehow, I, I'm not sure what the arrangement was, but that's a, one of those is, is what Keith Emerson uh, made Lucky Man on. I guess that, that launched the use of Moog synthesizers as live performance instrument. I still use this as part of my keyboard rig because nothing else makes um, a sound like it, really. It, uh, when you crank it up in a stadium, it can, um, it can hurt. <laughs> One of Keith's great talents 
is to approach a new instrument, a new, a new electronic instrument, and without anybody explaining too much about it, to turn the knobs and flip a few switches to see what happens, and then immediately get an idea of how that can be used musically. Immediate, you know, it can happen in seconds. And I imagine it, that must have happened with, with Lucky Man. Because what he came up with, uh, in, a, in a way of, of using the glide and getting the right, just the right tone color, are things that nobody had done up until then. Nobody had gotten that sound, and nobody had made those gestures uh, with the, uh, you know, with a, with a modular synthesizer. And it, 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 was, it was something. Not only was it something brand new, it sounded great. One of the coolest things that Moog is making these synthesizers. We get to do this, which is a dream come true for us, to make those instruments that Moog is so known for, to make them right, to make them visually perfect, sonically just right. It just blows my mind. It's just an amazing sound when you can play that instrument. Even one note at a time sounds so satisfying and so cool. It really does excite people who don't know anything about the technology or how it was done. I hear it and I'm like, this is amazing for right now. And so it's perfect that exactly 50 years after the first Moog synthesizer was seen by the public, we can come to AES 2014 and show the Emerson Moog Modular System. One of the cool things about modularity is that you get to make your own choices. You can hook things up wrong and sometimes generate interesting results. And so a lot of people have loved that, that it's not telling you what to do. It's an open-ended architecture. So there are sonics available, certainly because of the simplicity of the design that sounds so much better than modern technology tends to sound. The same reason people use vintage recording equipment. It sounds much better sometimes. So the sonics are available. Wide flexibility of, of tone is available. Each individual hooks up the synthesizer in their own way and creates something unique. So he was providing something very simple and powerful as an archetype, as a set for people to work with. This one is the voltage-controlled low-pass filter, which is arguably the most famous and sought-after module of the Moog Modular product line. It's renowned for its warm sound. All of the resistors, capacitors, and transistors, they're the same part numbers as the original. This rotary switch here is an original New Old Stock Mallory rotary switch, the same ones used in the 60s. Probably the most confounding thing about the Moog modular synthesizer is the use of the S-triggers. There's a lot of people in the world that say, you know, why, what's with this S-trigger stuff? And it's not even a voltage, it's a, it's a, a shorting to ground event. Why is that? It seems like a, a mixture of two completely different ways of doing things. There's no explanation in writing anywhere that came from Bob that said, this is why we did it this way. <clears throat> but if you look at the history and if you piece together things, you look at the old Herb Deutsch collaborations in the very early days where, you know, Herb would say, I want this kind of sound. I, I want to be able to make this kind of sound. I want this control over this sound. Hey, I want a keyboard so you can tune to like a 12-tone scale or at least an equally tempered musical scale and play it like an instrument. And by the way, if we want to trigger some kind of dynamic change, here's a doorbell button. And a doorbell button is a shorting to ground. So it kind of seems like that carried along into the whole S-trigger concept. His designs were, you know, elegant. In his mind, it was like, well, this is how you would do it. You know, you want to do this function, then you would do it this way. You know, just do this, do this, do this, do this. There, you're done. Kapow. And uh, you look at it and you go, well, you know, that's exactly the right way to do it. That was 
that's it. That's, he nailed it. I think by 1970 or 1971, most of the stuff that we associate with Moog synthesizers had already been developed, the individual pieces. It's how you put them together in a, into a music producing system. He wasn't trying to like, I'm gonna make the perfect instrument. He was like, I'm gonna make something that does what I want it to do, you know? And if he would say, Bob, this is perfect, he'd go, no, 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 it's just doing what I, just, I just did it. It's not big, no big deal. But it, to me, it's a big deal and it's no big deal this. To work for the company founded by Bob Moog, who produced this back in the 60s. That's, that's cool. To work on synthesizers for a living, that's cool. It's a lot more interesting than other forms of high tech, you know, computer related this or computer related that. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's great, that's fun, but it's not beautiful. It's just stuff. I think it would be a real loss if people didn't have a chance to work with these kind of systems now, because you can actually quite clearly hear the reality that there is sonic power, high fidelity, frequencies, dynamics that are not usually found on normal instruments. I think today people are actually more comfortable with this kind of technology, being able to use it and be more creative with it than they were even in the old days when it first came out. That was a new kind of thinking. It was a new kind of access to sound control. Now we've had decades of it. People are not afraid of it. In fact, they want to push the boundaries further. So the ideas still work really well. The ideas of simple modularity give us much more sonic power than even we used in the 60s and 70s when these were new. When you get this deep into a design, you do actually um, feel that you kind of catch, you get it, where, where he was coming from, you actually get it. And then I look at them and I realize this is going to outlast me and it's probably going to outlast my children. And also you realize that someday all of this is going to be dust. So it's like, well, let's pass it on, let's, let's share. Let's. Uh, let it be enjoyed. Ooh, what a lucky man he was.